So I'm going to invite everybody to just kind of move a bit. Um, you can turn off your video if you'd like to, uh, if that makes you self-conscious. But I'm going to invite everybody to stand up or uh, if you can't or won't stand up to move yourself into a more expansive space and get yourself out of screen for a second and just take a deep breath and, and enjoy yourself. Be someplace other than maybe where you're at. Maybe take a deep breath and imagine yourself in one of your favorite outdoor spaces and, and breathe that air in and share that experience with everybody that's on the call here today. I'm going to give you a second to take a real breath and move outside of your screen. Okay. So uh, with that, I just encourage you all to, um, to welcome our couple of guests here. I'm going to hand it over to Emily Irish, who's going to share a little bit with the Zoom, about the Zoom logistics and uh, uh, how we're going to work the schedule today, which is a little bit different from the last happening hour folks might have joined. So over to you, Emily, and thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you, Sarah. Can everyone see my slides? Um, all right, awesome. Again, I'm Emily Irish with Willamette Partnership. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're really excited to have you all here. Uh, just as a quick recap of what we're going to go through for the next hour is um, we're going to introduce our wonderful speakers, Sam and Jill, and then uh, have them do a quick presentation. And then we're going to open it up for a, a broader uh, Q&A portion of um kind of an open-ended panel as you think of uh questions please feel free to add them to the chat and um add those in and we can queue up some questions for that portion of of this hour uh you're also welcome to use the raise your hand function if you have a, a live question you want to ask for a follow-up uh, we'll kind of be moderating that and and calling on people as folks are presenting please remain on mute so that we don't get any feedback noise or extra background noises. Um, and then as you're uh, engaging in the Q&A portion, feel free to unmute yourself and jump right in. All right, and with that, I will hand it over to Bobby. Oh, and I want to say a quick thank you to our wonderful sponsors who make this kind of stuff possible that uh, Willamette Partnership is able to engage with all of you on. All right, to you, Bobby. Great, thanks so much, Emily. And hi, everybody, it's good to see you all. I'm Bobby with Willamette Partnership. Um, and we're really lucky to have uh, Jill Fugilter uh, here with us with My Memorial Trust, the Healthy Environment uh, Director, and then Sam Barrasso, the Program Manager at Portland Clean Energy Fund. And we've asked Jill and Sam uh, to speak to a, a couple of questions. Um, so we think about kind of the time we're in now, um, there will be a tomorrow. Um, and so thinking about kind of what equitable recovery might look like. So we've asked kind of uh, Jill and Sam to talk about that a little bit from their experiences. And if they had two or three things we might all ask um, out into the, the world or of our federal government or state government or whomever, what might some of those things be to advance equitable recovery? And then how do we have um, the capacity and how do we support our communities in Oregon to move towards equitable recovery. So with that, um, just as a FYI, we are um, recording um, and that way we'll be able to, to share some of what we've talked about uh, later as well. So Jill, why don't I hand it over to, to you first and then we'll go to Sam. All right, thanks. Uh, can y'all hear me? All right, excellent. Well, um, first I just wanna say thank you to the, um, the team at Willamette Partnership for organizing these conversations um, and for, um, you know, for all of the folks who are joining the conversation today uh, that you're here. Um, I do really appreciate these opportunities to connect with folks, um, even though they are virtual and hopefully we can have a happy hour in person, not too far into the future. Um, so, so I'm Jill uh, Fuglister. I, as um, Bobby said, I'm the Healthy Environment Portfolio Director at My Memorial Trust, and we're um, a private foundation in Oregon. And our mission is to support organizations, efforts, and communities that contribute to a flourishing and equitable Oregon. 
So when I think about um, this first question about equitable recovery and what it might look like based on my experience, I would start by saying it's not looking like a return to the normal, the, the past, what we've been experiencing relatively recently. Um, because that reality is, is deeply flawed, as probably everyone on this call knows, and the, the systems that created and maintained that normal were designed really to exploit and oppress people based on race and to overexploit nature. So I think we've all seen how this coronavirus crisis is really exposing this truth um, and, and how vulnerable it makes all of us. And so from my perspective, equitable recovery is really based on different values and goals. It's about goals like justice, resilience, reciprocity, social stability, and health. Um, it's really, it really must lead us to a future where communities are, are able to meet basic needs. We're seeing how that's not true for some of the most essential workers in this moment, um, while at the same time, healing and securing the health of, of people and the planet. And it's also got to be a future where communities are better prepared to respond to the many future emergencies that are going to arise as a result of climate change. Um, so if I had a couple or three things to um, ask the federal government or federal recovery actions, what might they be? Um, so the first is really like the design, design recovery that works for people of color and has a, a structural racism frame and design with a resiliency frame. We can't have a bailout for corporations. We need to focus on bailing out people and communities and the planet. Um, you know, we're going to need a lot of resources coming to states and local communities to build that green economy and community wealth future that um, many of y'all have been working on. Um, more specifically around the fossil fuel industry, um, there's been a lot of calls, and I, I like this, for uh, not bailing out the fossil fuel industry, but instead the federal government taking public ownership of it so it can phase it out in a way that keeps people whole and transitions them into building that equitable clean energy economy that um, I would say we want in the future. Um, and then I think that there's some accountability and oversight needs to happen at the federal level. So there's some sort of durable institution that can oversee um, how recovery funds are managed. I think um, the um, economic crisis that we experienced most recently, uh, 2009, 2010, et cetera, that, that showed um, a lot of um, lack of accountability. And so um, a lot of the um, um, rebuilding um, and uh, that happened through the stimulus wasn't necessarily rebuilding toward that future that we would want. Um, so what about Oregon communities? What, what was, uh, how can we help Oregon communities be ready for recovery? This third question that we were posed. Um, I think folks have been working on a lot of great policies that really can lead us to equitable recovery. So it's like, where do those fit in that package? Um, but I think where we aren't always focusing on um, is on uh, power structure and how institutions enable, uh, enable, you know, sort of power hoarding and um, hoarding of wealth and how do we disrupt that? And so I think that we need to both look at policy and power structure and think about what are the levers that we can embed into, you know, local state um, policy agendas that can move power towards working families, both in rural and urban communities and in black and brown communities in particular. I think, um, and Sam will talk about this, about Portland Clean Energy Fund is a really great example of being thoughtful about structural power and, um, and how to integrate that into a new funding structure. Um, so if we think about Oregon institutions that are going to be getting these federal dollars um, and be, be charged with managing how they get distributed, what is, what is the change that needs to happen in those distribution um, mechanisms so that we can deliver on that a vision of an equitable recovery? 
The other thing that I feel like um, is really important right now is, is, being, is building the narrative for this idea of just recovery and equitable recovery. Seems like there's a lot of listening happening now in, um, and, and I think there's a real opportunity, like people are hungry for um, a new nar narrative and kind of more receptive to it. You know, seeing the kind of um, willingness and ability for folks to come together collectively to, to cooperate and share and sacrifice for the greater good. Um, we have like, that's what we're doing right now and people are, are showing up um, and so this is really like, I think an amazing counter story to that sort of rugged individualism, sort of self-interest narrative that perpetuates that sort of flawed normal that we don't want to return to. And so I think if we can really keep growing this narrative of collective um, well-being um, and link it with accounting for our state's history of racism and environmental exploitation as a backdrop, we can help support the narrative around what it's going to look like to transition to a regenerative and just future. And then the last thing I would say is, um, again, I think this is kind of a reflection on the, um, the stimulus from the, um, the, the Great Recession. And there was a lot of shovel ready, shovel ready projects that, um, that really weren't, they were ready, but they weren't projects that were uh, building us towards the future of equity and sustainability that I think folks again on this call would be interested in. Um, so I think we need to look at what are the shovel ready projects that, that do um, exemplify that future that we want and then what else needs to be readied and then what isn't um, and how do we make sure that the shovel ready projects that are not about that future don't move forward as funds are released so those are my few thoughts to get started and uh, i'll turn it over to sam to pick up thank you jill i appreciate it um can folks hear me Okay, great. Um, it's a, I feel like it's an interesting point. And uh, so I'm the program manager with the Portland Clean Energy Fund. So this sits within the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability at the city. Um, it's a new fund. So in many ways, some of these questions we're wrestling with, we're certainly wrestling with now. Um, and um, just as a, as a background context, it's, it's funded with, um, with a surcharge on uh, corporations that make over a billion dollars nationally, $500,000 locally. Um, and when we're at full implementation, we'll be about funding anywhere in the realm of 40 to $60 million annually to invest in um, climate action initiatives that directly support community benefits, um, support those that have historically been left out of um, a lot of the sustainability and climate benefits that have accrued uh, for folks within the city, city of Portland. Um, and so it's certainly an interesting, I'd say, time we are in. And I, I really appreciate, Jill, you leaving off with the shovel ready because I think that's that's a lot when we think about sort of equitable recovery. It's it's certainly a lot of what has been playing through my mind is the fact that there is this there is, we're going to be faced with this tension to move quickly, get things done, and that tension is certainly going to be pivoting and looking towards those shovel ready projects. And so, I think maybe at an outset, I would say it's all it's about all of those good things that we want to see moving forward. But when we think about shovel ready projects that is historically inherently and that those have been the types of projects we've invested in in the previous recession it's it's those that can put those quick proposals together and have them ready to go as, as we as we march to get money out and i think as we we're going to need to resist some of that temptation and certainly we're going to need to move many shovel ready projects but we're going to need to have a balance to that um, because reality is that we know that the groups that have historically not had investments in them, communities of color, low income folks, will not necessarily have had the opportunity to dream up and have on themselves those shovel ready projects. So I think that's, that's certainly going to be a huge thing we're going to need to invest in. We're going to need to invest in helping communities that have historically been left out that we know continue to be left out and, 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 and are at the, yeah, will, will certainly be most um, most at risk in this current time to be left out that we're going to need to be able to invest in them to be able to plan during this time and make sure that we have a strategic approach towards yes investing in some of those shovel ready projects we want to see um, but certainly investing in the opportunity for a lot of those groups to be able to, to dream that up and 
And what that means is, is contrary to what it feels, it means being, being patient. Um, and so I think at, in, in recognizing at that same end, we have to address real needs now. So uh, a, a lot of the conversation has certainly been for, for me internally about how we think strategically about evaluating our various resources and determining what we spend now to keep those in our community that are most vulnerable afloat and what resources we have to make sure that we can plan for that, fu for that better future. Um, certainly with the, with, with the Portland Clean Energy Fund, it's, it's, I'd say from a political perspective, it's a resource that, has, that sits there, that is a resource that in, in many ways in public funds hasn't already been uh, assigned or hasn't already been subscribed to. And so it was a tempting resource and there was a lot of fierce defense to say, no, no, this resource is a critical resource to set aside for that recovery because certainly a lot of the resources that have come down from the federal government to the CARES Act have been focused on this sort of um, very immediate, near term, three months addressing this public health crisis. And, and, and yet we do know other resources will come down for that recovery. Um, and so I think that's, that's a little bit of just recognizing that I know that, I, that that's a little bit of some of the thoughts that have been going through my mind. Um, and I mean, and it's, it's, it's a profound time I would acknowledge that we're in. And I think that that time is certainly the, the, the moment we are in is being felt by everyone in various different ways. Um, and, and I think I imagine everyone goes through various emotion and also it vacillates in, in various different places of charge ahead. I've got, I think I know what I'm going to do to just complete loss. And I think we need to recognize where we're in, in that and, and recognize that not everyone's going to be there ready to just march ahead with some of those projects. So we, we, it's just, it's sort of that patience that we're going to need to have for one another as we move through this. And that's not going to manifest in those federal resources, but it's going to manifest in those of us that are implementing that and creating that space. Um, when I think about two to three things, I mean, I think certainly all the things that are coming to top of mind are absolutely, I mean, tech infrastructure came up first and foremost for many folks in terms of just being able to connect in this way. And now that we've been in this for some time, I know many of folks have figured this out, but, but not everyone. Um, I think about, you know, two to three things that ask is just making sure that we're always focusing, investing on those most impacted. Um, and whatever policy considerations we have, and, and that, that's going to take a lot of different forms. Um, certainly, and I appreciate foundations, certainly, I know Meyer has stepped up just less restricted funding. I know it's something that, 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 that's been called upon because it's, it's hard to tie those restrictions in this current moment. Um, and that's something we certainly wrestle with within, within the program itself, given we have very tight restrictions. We have, we, have, we have restrictions on our funding. Um, and then just Things that have come to mind, I mean, and this is an area that I don't play in, but I know that I've got a 20 month old and we've certainly been balancing childcare, she's 22 months. <laughs> and we've been balancing childcare and thinking through that, but knowing, knowing that that's a real thing for many folks is that, that childcare and it's, it's been, um, as a society, we've not, you know, we don't have, whether it's preschool for all, whether it's daycare, whatever else, thinking through how we systemically provide that childcare and that, that that's a critical resource we need to be thinking about as a community. So I think, um, I think I'm trying to make sure I hit all the various things. And I, so I, maybe I would just acknowledge as we think about making, helping Oregon communities be ready, I'd say that those planning resources and, and making it supporting folks now so that as those resources start coming down that folks can take advantage of those and, and have proposals ready. And I say folks, those that just don't have those shovel ready projects, um, certainly investing in both place-based and culturally specific uh, organizations so that they can address their communities both in place and those that, that don't necessarily have a place identity. Um, and then thinking as we are going to see inevitably a whole host of resources coming down that envision and I envision those being infrastructure resources that we think really thoughtfully about that if before those come down we need to organize all of our various communities to know that those are coming down because that is going to be a critical piece for our, for keeping folks in place and not pushing them and displacing them further. When those rents come due when this gets lifted, folks aren't going to be able to pay however many months of back rent when they haven't been working. And so um, it, it's, it's thinking through whether it's rental relief, a whole host of other things, but also just making sure we maintain that probably that, that, that fabric, that connection to, to each other, to place so that folks know these resources are coming down and it's important we keep you here and we figure out how to do that. So 
think a big part of that is investing in culturally specific organizations that, that are trusted institutions that have those connections to folks, as well as place-based organizations that can do that. Um, so that when we do get those resources in, we're not necessarily, we're not just, we're not investing in those, we're not investing in upgrading our infrastructure and, 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 and for those that no longer exist here. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll say that much and um, I'll, I'll stop there. And Jill, thank you so, so much. Really appreciate those, those thoughts. Um, so for folks, as, if you have questions for Sam and Jill or, or for each other, um, feel free to start putting those into the, the chat function and, and we, can, we can ask. Um, similarly, if you want to just uh, raise your hand, um, which is a, a, an emoji in the participant uh, bar, we can, we can call on you too. And while you're getting those questions teed up in, in chat, um, Sam, Jill, I'd, I'd love to bug you with that, the first question, if that's okay. Um, but just curious what you've seen happening uh, from government in particular, whether it's local or state or federal government, and actions that they're taking that you'd like to see made permanent or you'd like to see other governments look to and say, ah, what those guys are doing is awesome. Please go do more of that. Yeah, I'll, 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 the, the, the two obvious, I mean, maybe two that have come top of mind for me, and I, I know there are many more, um, but, but certainly, I mean, and it hasn't happened here, but in other, other places, there has been just as as folks have wrestled with what it means to provide public transit and folks being able to get on buses and not necessary and, 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 and give that proper space for the bus driver, but getting in the back entrances, a lot of places just as a, as a matter of doing that from a public policy perspective have done no fare free transit. And, and that's something that has certainly been an ab advocacy that has been done by, I know, Opal Environmental Justice and others have advocated around that, but that's something that it gives us an opportunity to really just just try that in this context and explore what that means. And it's always this play around with resources, resources, and then we can, we can get into those conversations. But um, I think that has been explored, that, that has been tried in other, other places, and it has been taken back as well. I want to acknowledge there's, there's tensions in that. But I think that kind of experiment is something that um, certainly as we come back, I think it's something I'd love to see more of. And I think the other one that's just come to the top of mind for me is, um, and given the work that, that, that certainly I'm involved in is, has been, um, Seeing our utilities, you know, not turn off utilities, whether it's our water, gas, uh, electricity, and, and that's something there's been a whole host of advocacy around for years around utility shutoffs and preventing those certainly in the winter time. And I mean, there's a whole host of data that, that say when utility shutoff programs are in effect, you know, evictions, folks are not evicted as often because they're, they're paying their rents and, and they're not forced to make a choice. And when those are, when they're not in place, they're forced to make a choice and, and they and, and, and oftentimes those are the second leading cause of getting evicted. So those are some of the things that I think we can start really wrestling with meaningfully around how to make sure that we can create those policies in place. And, 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 and another utility I'd say is it's certainly just the importance of having um, universal access to broadband. So that, that goes without saying, but that just, that, that's a conversation that, that's long overdue. I'll, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll add a couple things um, that I think, um, you know, we're seeing like a lot of local governments jump in and, and not lots of different entities, not just the local governments, but I don't think they all are in this business generally, but around creating kind of these small business, local business res rescue funds, I'm going to say, like um, loans that they're um, trying to help provide some support with. Um, and when I think of like long term solutions, it, I mean, it really could be that those could be converted or grown into sort of like community wealth funds, you know, we have our community development financial institutions in the state, but how do we like boost those to really make um, uh, a bigger investment in again, this local economy um, growth across the state. Um, I think that's one area. Uh, another thing that's been um, really heartening to see was the Oregon Worker Relief Fund that was uh, the state invested $10 million into in recognition that some of our most essential workers fall through the cracks in terms of access to unemployment um, and other 
you know, benefits. And so is there a way to create an ongoing source of support for essential workers who um, are in that space of, of, of falling through the cracks? And then the other thing that I'm um, just kind of in that transportation space that um, Sam was, you know, talking about transit, I'm going to sort of lift up the example of uh, opening up streets and um, create for bike, bike and pedestrian either greater emphasis or, and, uh, or completely focused only on a bike and pedestrian only. So there's a, kind of these experiments going on and you know, of course it's been happening um, for a long time, but a lot of communities haven't tested that out, um, but we're just seeing a whole bunch of that right now. So what will that tell us about what we can do in terms of creating more transportation choices, active transportation choices. So those are a few um, other things. I'm sure other folks Great. have other other things they could share because I would I would be curious to hear what's exciting to other folks on the call. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna issue that invitation um, out to folks. Um, so Ashley, uh, you had your you had your hand up. Uh, feel free to ask a question, but. Just like Jill, Jill said, um, we'd love to hear what you have to say if you if you have ideas. But go for it. Yeah. Um, well, one thing, you know, thank you by the way for bringing everybody together, and it's really great to hear from Jill and Sam, and to see so many folks gathering to talk about these issues that are so important. Um, but I recently got to sit on one of the PSEF uh, webinars to hear about actually the organizational uh, capacity resources work group um, and I thought that that was incredibly transformative what they are doing through that PSEP program to do what Sam was talking about and really invest in place-based and um, you know culturally specific organizations to give them the capacity to be able to access these kinds of grants and funds that are going to come down so I'd love Sam to talk a little bit more about that because I think that's incredibly transformative uh, that process and Sam just before you do that Ashley you said PSEF like Portland Clean Energy Fund yes PSEF? yes oh, yeah. Okay. yeah yeah they're gonna make it well my kind of takeaway was that they're gonna make it so that organizations that are kind of tiny and overstretched and maybe under resourced um, are gonna have the capacity to access uh, these kind of bigger funds that are gonna be coming out of the Clean Energy Fund I think that's essential so Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I I think that's ex it's exactly that. It's um there's just the recognition that to put together applications takes takes resources and takes time. And um I will I will acknowledge that we we know that what we will provide will probably will still not. There, we're always working from a deficit, and that is inherently that is always um that's an internal thing that I recognize that uh we will not be able to solve everything. And so that is always a struggle, but we will, we're will we always gonna to try to think creatively around how we remove those barriers. And so the, what, what we certainly are working on is providing, and we don't know whether this is gonna be sort of just in a COVID year or ongoing that you'd see it every year, but just even in order to apply for resources, if, and we're still working on the details of this and talking with city attorneys to make sure we can do all this in a way that's above board. But, but just uh, providing resources in the realm of up to $5,000 for various pieces to support folks working on an application, recognizing that they may get to the end of that and decide that they can't act, that they're actually not ready to apply this year because it doesn't make sense for them. So we're, we're, we're working through those sorts of details around how we provide just training, technical assistance, one-on-ones, as well as actual monetary resources so that we know larger organizations have grant writers and we know smaller ones won't. And so we know that providing some of those sorts of resources will be critical. So it's something we're, we're certainly working through for this first year. Um, we'll be and likely targeting smaller, smaller organizations although we're working on defining that. And it would be essentially available. Yep. Oh, no, no, sorry. Go ahead, Sam. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, yeah, but the idea is that that's just available, simple application beforehand. Hopefully it's a, it's a, it, the idea is that it's, it's, it's a pretty simple piece to just say, um, yeah explain sort of the your organization what you're doing and and that yeah you're a small organization and that'd be available before you apply so just as a quick follow-up to that sam and jill both meyer and, and clean energy fund are, are kind of known nationally for kind of using trust-based approaches and community-centered approaches 
I mean, when you talk, say, with state agencies or state governments or um, other other uh, partner foundations or cities in other places, what would be the one or two things other folks could do to take a step towards where you already are? Well, I can start and say, um, <laughs> sorry, Sam, I was like, you weren't muted, so I thought you were going to go, but you're really thinking, like, I, I'm going to offer that I feel like we have a lot of work to do in that space still, um, but, uh, you know, I, I do think um, meaningfully engaging um, folks who are receiving dollars in you know, parts of the decision making, I'm always a little reluctant to be like, come and spend all your time and energy reviewing applications when, you know, there's a tension because folks are doing really important work on the ground. And then if we suck them into the decision making process around, you know, delivering dollars out, it, it sort of pulls them away. At the same time, that is a structural power building, um, opportunity. So I think that there's just sort of a balance to strike. So how do you do that in ways that preserves um, the ability of organizations and individuals to be really doing their on the ground, I'm going to call it on the ground work, um, without, you know, fully um, in service to, uh, you know, maybe at our decision making process. But I think there are ways to do that. Um, and you know i i just i think it's um the the listening and the feedback loops are really important um and i think we're still working on that and just in terms of our feedback loops <laughs> we um you know telling folks ha uh, after they're sharing the insights and perspectives on um, what more we can be doing and then making sure we're circling back to say how that has influenced decisions if they aren't at the table fully making those decisions but but um and then the other way um and we're doing some testing i would say some strategy some work in this space is really co-creation which is which is awesome um but again uh really have to look for that alignment of interest to to not again det detract from the on the ground work of the organizations Thank you, Joe. I think if I to add to, to that, um, thank you for going first. <laughs> I, uh, I would say it, it is in earnest, truly listening. I think it's, um, it is a hard, uh, it's a hard thing. And, I, and I, it's, it's a hard thing being in any, I think, being a public funder, you're asked, um, and I imagine I, private funders do, you're asked uh, for a lot of different pieces. And I think um, the biggest thing in navigating that, it's certainly for us have been, and I think that the, maybe I would just say the slight difference with the public is just that there's this public scrutiny. And, and it's in, in navigating that, it is the biggest thing we can try to do is, is listen. I think my, but my best compliment came out of, uh, we came out of, we had a workforce and contractor equity uh, design session bring in a whole host of um, what I generally say are more, um, it can be a more contentious conversation. It's probably the one that I was most fearful of uh, early in January before all this happened. And I think the, the best compliment I got afterwards was someone that had been to many of those from many project starts. And he was just like, I heard across the board, this was the best one that I'd been to. And it wasn't because of what we said. It was because people genuinely felt like we had come to the table without a predetermined outcome. And that feeling matters. It matters that folks feel like you're genuinely there to co-create it and that you're genuinely listening. And so, um, and that, that meant something because it might, the outcome may not actually ultimately be so different from those other programs, but developing that trust and that process is really, really important. Um, and so, it's it's not easy to do that, but I think that's an that's a really that's just a critically important piece to to, to doing this. Um, and then I would say we all have limited capacity, limited budgets in terms of how we get how we connect with folks and bring folks into the work that we do. And so just prioritizing that outreach, recognizing that 
I, I'm not necessarily worried about the dominant institutions, dominant white-led institutions that have been in the space for a long time. They are going to get, they are, they are going to access PCF just fine. But it is absolutely the, 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 the small two-person indigenous organization, the small few-person black organization that do not see themselves in this, that I absolutely have to do outreach to make sure they see themselves in this. So I just think it is, we've got, it is, it fundamentally, we do have to talk about prioritization of resources and what that looks like and how, what it looks like to do that outreach. So um, I think that those would be the, the, the two things that I certainly lead with is, 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 is those things are really important. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sam and Jill. We've got a couple questions relative to workforce development investments as well. I'll circle back around to those in a second, but Astrid, um, you had a question. You want to go ahead and, and ask it? Yeah, sure. And I'm sitting here in my aspirational running gear. <laughs> um, thank you for your comments, Sam and, and Jill. So I've been following, as we all have, right, the dismal implementation of the CARES Act and um, the way it's been disenfranchising women and people of color, business owners. And I can't help but think that Oregon is small enough as a state, right, as what, not even 5 million of us, that we should be able to create a laboratory and, and um, sort of proactively lead into sort of effectively a green new deal, right, that is inclusive, that injects restorative justice into our economy. And it, it would seem like we have some of the key pieces, you know, with PCEF and we have enlightened uh, look philanthropy like Meyer. But my question to you all is, who do you think could be a convener of a statewide effort that is inclusive, is trusted by all the stakeholders, and can actually set that table? Because um, I want to find that unicorn. <laughs> I wonder if they exist. I, you know, I don't know if it necessarily has to be a singular convener. I think the, the recognition that it takes, it takes, it takes time to build the trust in those relationships and those coalitions. And so um, I don't know who singularly can do that. Um, but I, I think it's just, a, I, I would acknowledge that as that comes together, that it would just be that it would take time to develop that trust uh, amongst folks to say that this is, this is, you know, we as a broad coalition that reflect, you know, the will of the of the people that have historically been left out of this, that 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 we 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 want to move this forward in this way. So, um, so that and that that, and, and it's 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 important. It it takes it takes long some trust building, and it takes certainly certainly being statewide. Um, so, um, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Astrid, that's an awesome question. <laughs> Um, and I do tend to um, have that thought too about the fact that Oregon, given our size of our population and the fact that, you know, there is relative, you know, like connectedness between like, you know, between leadership in philanthropy and in state government and in business, like people know each other. Um, you know, it's not like a state like New York where it's, you know, so much population, or California, so much population. So um, I think it's a great question. I would love to see a table that is, you know, to Sam's point, multiple, um, I guess, sectors and conveners. And I guess the, well, that's, that's a tricky part. Um, and I do think philanthropy has a potential role in that. Um, but how do we make sure that the, um, you know, communities of color, low income communities who really need to have a strong voice um, and have power in that conversation could really be uh, centered in in organizing and um, playing a leadership role. Well, so, and it can happen quite quickly, right? Like, I mean, if you all have seen, uh, I don't know if you've seen BBPDX's letter that got put together mm -hmm. uh, for yeah, the governor, yeah. right? And, and there's like, what, over 30, it was a yep. truly a rainbow coalition that came together very quickly to sign mm -hmm. on to a letter that mobilized as many dollars, 10 million, in this little state of Oregon, then was released federally to the community development um, uh, banking administration, whatever it's called, right? So mm -hmm. it's a it's an outsized impact when you compare it to the federal um, uh, response to COVID, and and so I would love for all of us to figure out a way how we can, you know, build on those kinds of efforts. Um, I mean, I 
I know how long it takes to build trust and the endless one-on-one -on -one and coffee meetings that, that one puts into it. But I have to believe that there is an opportunity to maybe accelerate some of these um, processes, right, o around a shared uh, opportunity like, um, you know, leading, leading the nation into a, a greener economy. I, I suppose if I was to respond to that, Astrid, that in, that, in that kind of that pace, I mean, what I would say is you you have to you you have to leave with those that have not been at the table. I mean, you you that is that fundamentally, it, 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 if we are leading with the usual actors at the table, nothing changes. Um, it is it is the same playbook. And so maybe that's if it was a starting place around how you move quick. I think you start there. You can at least start with the base of that's a set of leadership I haven't seen there before. And at least they may have my vested interest at heart because they, they look a lot closer like me and they're representing folks that don't that don't have this access. So I, I think that'd be my shortest like shortcut to that answer that if I was going to try to do it, that'd be my crash course in trying it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and I think on, on some of these themes, we don't have to leave these themes here. Um, we can we can keep keep some of the conversations going and, and uh, chase some of these down. Um, let Nisa, if, if you're okay, I'm going to come back to you, um, but kind of ask the question around intentionality around uh, workforce development investments. So, okay, we talked about shovel ready projects going to people who own shovels, but what about people who who aren't there yet? So, and kind of Stacy, uh, Glenn asked that question, Stacy followed on with, are there examples of workforce development or skill building programs already in existence in, in Oregon um, that we might intentionally think about building up, investing, supporting, um, so that uh, lots of different folks can access those uh, recovery uh, projects? Yeah, there, there is, I mean, there is a, it's during recessions, the workforce sort of development machine, I mean, work systems is within our regional, so our regional workforce development board, and they have a whole host of programs. And that's not my realm of depth, although certainly within the context of clean energy, we are certainly thinking through what does, you know, when we think about the 2009 recession, it was a lot of it was rooted in, you know, housing, a lot of construction starts so there is a workforce that was really ready in there that we could sort of pivot to a lot of these infrastructure projects we were moving from building homes to building renewable energy all these all these various other infrastructure projects that was, that was part of a lot of the american recovery investment act dollars i think in this in this context i think that is that's certainly going to be the question of just where you have service workers that are uh, that have been first and you know first hit in terms of sort of a sector um whether that does translate to a lot of these, certainly the things that I'm thinking about, which is, you know, the pre-apprenticeship program so we can get folks into those and then get them into apprenticeship programs. So we are building them into the trades and other things that revolve around sort of this broader clean energy economy. Um, so I, I think sort of the, the conversations are happening. You're going to see that infrastructure, that broader, what a lot of those federal dollars will come through through those workforce development boards. And so you will see the, the, that machine spin up in a way that probably hasn't been spun up when, when the economy is good, those, those, those programs sort of scale back. Um, but it, I, I'd say we, we, have, we have a network there and it is, it is going to be pushed also. Um, so it's an imperfect answer and it just reflects sort of the fact that I'm not deep into that sector. Uh, I am also not deep in that sector, but I would say um, just thinking about, and I know there's people on this call who can speak better to this than I, but about rural um, communities and I think of like the stewardship um, and restoration economy um, and there's the, um, you know, there's some really good models that, uh, that we have in the nonprofit sector. Um, and in partnership with government in some some of those rural spaces that have been, you know, slowly tackling um, rural uh, or excuse me restoration, uh, you know, ecosystem restoration on federal um, lands in particular, but um, you know, on state lands as well. And so that could also be a space. Um, and and tribal communities um, are 
are involved in that in particular, um, but I would love to see more connection and integration of tribes, not just, you know, it also in the clean energy economy as well. Um, can, I, can I see a comment? Hmm. I, I, I feel like it's worth flagging that comment by Roland Schmidt, um, just the Green Work, Green Work First Collaborative, which is a partnership between EcoTrust, uh, Native American Youth and Family Center, uh, Self Enhancement Inc., and Wisdom of the Elders. And it's about creating a workforce sort of development program. I know, my, I know Jill, you're, you all are involved in that, but it's about creating a workforce development program centered on um, the, the Black and Indigenous community. Um, yeah, that's, we've been that's, super that's, that's excited, event. yeah, to invest in that. And and now with PCEF coming online, it's even more exciting to imagine um, how, you know, those um, programs that are still really, or that whole collaborative is in startup, but even within that, the different organizations involved and have their sort of small programs in, in green workforce development, how those can really grow up um, and, um, you know, get, sort of integrated into what's going to happen in communities in Portland um, in implementing PCEF. But yeah, how do we, how do there, and there are, there are other examples of that, um, not quite as robust uh, in other communities across the state that we should be tapping into, but um, yeah. Yeah, there, some yeah. other folks are sharing some examples. <laughs> yeah, we're getting some good stuff. Um, and Anissa, I'm gonna, uh, let you ask your question here in a second, but I'm also wondering, uh, I'm seeing Professor uh, Romali and uh, Professor Reyes Santos on with us as well, um, who I know both have really deep experience and the kind of connection between equitable recovery and public service. And so I'm just curious um, after this next question, if you have any kind of thoughts or, or reflections as well. Um, so Anissa? Yeah, thank you everyone and thanks for all the great questions and um, I appreciate Sam and Jill taking time to talk with us today. Um, yeah, my question is maybe a little bit more basic, <laughs> like big picture, um, but I'm really curious knowing that the current administration is unlikely to be very much investing in, you know, these local projects that we're all so passionate about. I, I'm really curious about what the role is of philanthropy, both city philanthropy and you know, private philanthropy in investing in these local community-based nonprofits that I think are going to be more at risk in the next year to two years. So it's a little bit more basic, but I appreciate you all answering it. Um, yeah, so we're, Anissa, we're super um, concerned about that ourselves. Um, and so trying to be in communication with organizations about um and there's kind of a range of uh you know it's it's been obviously straining on every organization um in one you know shape or form um you know the crisis and kind of what that means for their their future but i think um you know there's some creativity also happening around um and that's what's really cool to see is all the creative um ideas that folks are either coming up with to boost their organizations, you know, sort of they have like a funding gap that's kind of emerged from this moment. Um, but also um, even some creative conversations around mergers and different ways of working together that um, that will also help sort of long term maintain the mission and the work, but maybe not structurally in the same way. But but we're um, we're actively listening uh, and wanting to hear from folks about how we can um, support organizations as they're grappling with that question because we can't quite obviously predict exactly how long this is going to be this and in what forms it will take um, as as we move forward and so um, not a great answer but <laughs> a few thoughts. <laughs> Thanks, Jill. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, you well, asked ahead. me um, if I would speak. I shall speak. Um, what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> what I wanted to talk about was not the specifics of this very important agenda itself, 
But the fact that so many of our organizations are trying to figure this out at the same time. So, for instance, I've spent all day uh, at Portland State talking with people about how can we prepare for a future we can't yet predict in a way that's different from how we've tried to work together before. It kept throwing us back to old ways of trying to decide what questions were important and who should be at the table and how to decide what to do. So what I'm particularly interested in is the rich way in which I'm hearing people trying to imagine not just why it's important to have a, an approach that is truly inclusive, but starting to think about how we would actually do it. And Sam, your approach of saying we've got to build trust is true, but I would love to spend a little time talking about where do we have this already that we could build out from? <laughs> I, Sam, Sam, can I can I let Pro, uh, Professor Rea Santos yeah, re respond then to? Uh, we're just closing up on five, and one of the things that we have is the potential for future conversation as well. So this is kind of thinking about well, what might we want to come together again and talk talk about, and then and then Sam will circle back around. I mean, uh, thank you all. Thank you for asking, Bobby, uh, and thank you for that as well, uh, Professor Ramley. Um, I mean, I have a lot of things in my mind, but hearing all of you, I feel like that piece of, there's so many of us trying to figure this out right now is really encouraging and empowering. Uh, just getting to meet all of you is amazing. I keep meeting people every week that I haven't met before. And I think a few things for me that are very concrete around equitable re recovery. One of them is um, not thinking about how is it that questions of documentation are impacting people's access to any kind of equitable recovery green jobs, for example, whether it's on house people, trans identified people, farm worker, migrant farm workers who don't have identification forms are accepted by government. So how is it that we can consider that as something that could be pushed aside as a requirement for access to any kind of potential green jobs that appear? That's something that I think about recently. Uh, thinking about equity lens and equity community accountability on any kind of infrastructure projects. And this is like my dream. I think that any kind of equitable recovery work projects that are approved should have an equity lens to be required to do some kind of consultation, even if they're trouble ready, <laughs> even if they're like, the, I like that idea, Sam, of like, go fund the trouble ready and go fund those that are still kind of, you know, do a little mix of investments. That makes so much sense to me. There's, we have all these emergency issues, but we also need to have the equity piece that may require some other time that's important. Uh, but thinking about how even those show already projects can have the equity lens be central to how decision making is happening, implementation is happening, so the equity central to the work that's happening as well. And, um, you know, and I think thinking about recruitment and retention of green jobs and new leaders, there's many ways in which I feel like universities are not tapped as like places where you can actually connect with um, young people who want to be leaders in the green job sector but don't have necessarily the training to do that work. They don't know how to plug into the industry itself, um, especially if they're our first generation students, students of color, queer students. Uh, they don't have the plugin. So I'm always thinking about how do we create plugins to be able to create that pipeline of new leaders in the, in the EJ sector as well. So those are a few things. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, Sam, Jill, any, any kind of thoughts or reflections there to and then I just want to make sure we leave just a couple minutes to think about where do we want to where do we want to go next? How might we engage everyone here? You know, thinking about what some principles of equitable recovery could look like. I will just say the easy answer in terms of to Professor Ramallah's question about where do we start where that trust exists, I would certainly say, and I'd point to Anissa there. Uh, she's at the, Anissa there at the Coalition of Communities of Color, um, and they um, are helping coordinate the coalition that put 
the, the Portland Clean Energy Fund on the ballot and, 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 helping, and, and helping move that work forward. And so that's a place where there is a built-in base of trust. And so that's a starting place that speaks to Portland. So that's one place to just start with existing strong coalitions that are frontline led. Um, and then um, I'd say just to, I appreciate the point, the point around undocumented workers is incredibly valid. Um, we just are now digging into that where, where when we put our dollars into a project, if federal dollars come into that and that's matching our dollars and those federal dollars have certain criteria, maybe we actually don't want to have that match as part of our dollars because that impacts how folks engage with that program and the tracking. So that's something we're wrestling with very much right now. Um, so it's, it's, it's certainly top of mind and that equity lens piece, I agree. I, I, will, I will fully agree. I just wanted to say that I put my email address in the chat box for people who are interested in learning more about what the PCEF coalition is looking forward to in the next year or so. Uh, the Portland Clean Energy Fund Coalition. Thanks, Anissa. Well, it's, these hours go by awfully fast. Um, we really appreciate everyone coming together um, and wanted to just issue a, just kind of a quick ask out to folks, um, which is if we wanted to come together in a, in a couple weeks for another conversation, we had the first conversation was about, you know, from community based organizations, what asks do they have for the conservation community. This was about principles for equitable recovery. Do we want to come back together again and have a conversation? And if yes, what might we talk about? Feel free to put those in chat. Um, Emily and I will follow up with a, a quick poll, just to um, an email to, to get uh, folks who want to think about it a little bit. But feel free to post in the chat. Um, and then one of the things that we did after the the first conversation was just issue a, a, a blog, a joint blog, with whoever wanted to, to join us to put together something jointly. And so wondering if, if anybody is interested in doing something like that together around what principles of equitable recovery could look like or whatever, um, we're, we're open um, to what that could look like. So feel free in the, in the chat function or to email Emily or I afterwards and we're happy to, to do that. So Emily, why don't, I, why don't I pass it over to you? And again, feel free to either say, hey, this is the topic I'd really like to talk about on a future happening hour in the chat, or yeah, totally give me a, a call about uh, writing up some equitable recovery principles. Great, thanks, Bobby. And yeah, thanks again, everyone, for this incredible conversation. I've been typing away on the other end here, um, trying to capture everything. Um, and thanks again to Sam and Jill for taking the time to participate um, again, I've just added my email into the chat and feel free to send me any ideas. We're organizing these happening hours for the foreseeable future. Um, we're trying to do them every other Wednesday. Um, you can see our next one is up, uh, which we're calling a friend's choice. We're kind of leaving it a little more open-ended for some of these bigger conversations. And that's, um, is that May 20th, I believe. Um, but it's on our website where you registered for this one. Um, under happening hours and please feel free to, to head over there and, and register um, and we'll be pushing our blog out with a nice summary. So if you'd like to participate or co-author that blog with us and share some of your ideas, please feel free to let me know. And thanks again. Thanks everybody. Thank you all. Take care. Thank Be you. well. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Emily.